see you today. Well, God is doing some great things through people's lives as we've been going through this how to study the Bible yourself. We're in this series called BYOB, Bring Your Own Bible. We've been kind of emphasizing the paper Bible, and it's been pretty awesome. I've had a number of people say, hey, I didn't have a study Bible. I had a Bible, didn't have a study Bible, didn't know the value of it, and a number of people have gotten themselves a study Bible. I think that's incredible. I love it. I think uh, God's going to do some great stuff. And so we're not done. We're going to kind of talk a little bit more today about the value of reading and studying your Bible, letting God's Word penetrate your life. Because there's a lot of good books out there. There's, there's a lot of great books. You go to the self-help book shelf in uh, like Barnes and Nobles or on Amazon. There's a lot of great books out there that will tell you things that are helpful. Hey, don't be so negative. Uh, try to get some more organization in your life. Uh, a number of good things, but they don't give you the power to do it. You see, the Bible is a supernatural book. When we read it, when we study it, when we let God work through his word into our heart, it starts to transform us. It's not just good stuff. It's like, I'm going to give you the power to make it happen too. So it changes everything. That's why it's so powerful. That's why we want to take the, the, the time we've taken in the summer and actually study it. And that God will speak through it. It's not just fairy tales. You know, that's how some people view it. You know, they just, oh, it's a bunch of fairy tales. And maybe you can get some life lessons. Who knows? Well, that's the wrong perspective. You see, God, the Word of God actually created the universe. I mean, the, 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 we call it, they call it, what, the Big Bang? Well, there's the Big Banger. <laughs> he created the universe by the spoken word. It changed everything. Look at what the Bible says. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. And so the power that God demonstrates in creating the universe from the very beginning, you know, with the hydrogen and helium, and then, you know, after that, all of the stuff that we see today, to, the, to what you see today, and the things that you're challenged with. God's power wants, is there to help you. And so, you know, the Bible says, let there be light. That's the spoken word. And the word we have, when we have the, God's word, when we have the Bible, we refer to as God's word, because it's the same spirit and life that created the universe, that created the stars, God wants to do in your life. Jesus said, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Not just words. They're the power to transform. If you allow God, you come in with a, a sense of humility, some faith, and watch what God can do. There is nothing impossible with God. The Bible says the word of God is living and active. Living, that Greek word zeo, zeo, zeo which is, you know, maybe uh, you know somebody who's named uh, Zoe. That's, that comes from the word life, to live. Active, energeos, which is where we get our word energy. There's life, there's power, there's energy. The ability to change things. It says the Bible or God's word is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. That's getting down there. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's like a surgeon's scalpel. God doesn't use a chainsaw or a skill saw. He gets in down there and says, okay, we're going to be working on this now. No, no, God, I want, you, I want you to do this. No, we'll do that later. We're doing this now. And he comes in like a surgeon's scalpel. When we use, when we read God's word, he starts to change things. He starts to point stuff out. I love this quote by the great D.L. Moody, the great evangelist of the previous generation. The Bible was not given to increase our knowledge. The Bible was given to change our lives. So when you read God's Word, when you read the Bible, 
you put in your mind, okay, God, I want you to change my life. I, I, I give you permission to start changing things and watch what God does. So we're going to look at five ways that God can change me. Five ways God's word can change me. Number one is it recreates me. The Bible talks about it as being born again. But in other words, when things are falling apart, things aren't going the way I want, uh, life starts to come unraveled, uh, it's just, you know, it gets hard, things are have gone into the gutter, gone to the dogs, all that kind of stuff. God, if we allow God to do something in our life, he'll give you a fresh start, a new beginning, a new life. That's why Jesus talked when he was talking to a theologian of his day, uh, Nicodemus. He was trying to figure this out. Like, hey, I'm kind of, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. I'm, I'm an older guy. Jesus said, even you can be born again. That's where, the, that's where that term comes from. They're in the Gospel of John. He says, even you. It doesn't, because what God's doing is something in, this, in, the, in our spirit, in our heart. That's what he's doing. And so we allow God to come in. God was delighted to give us birth by the truth of his infallible word. So he's not talking about the physical birth when you were born. He's talking about when you're born again. By the, when we, the word of God comes and starts to change us. We can't do it on our own. You can't be saved on your own. You can't go to heaven on your own. You can't learn about dying on the cross on your own. You learn that. You, you learn the purpose of life and the purpose for your life through God's word. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's where we learn that. Otherwise, without God's word, we're just kind of making stuff up, which is really what a lot of morality is, a lot of religions are, just kind of making stuff up. Our efforts to try to, you know, figure out life and figure out who God might be, and yet God came through Jesus Christ to say, no, this is the way. This is what you do. Look at this word here. It says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed. I love how the Bible, we've looked at that over the last few weeks, how the Bible is often referred to as seed. It comes and takes root in our heart. Our heart's kind of like the soil, our, the spirit part of us, and God then produces something out of it. And so there's, it's not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring Word of God. So God's Word has the ability to recreate life. Something that I thought was dead, it's, it's buried, it's, it's ruined, it's in the past, and, it, and that's often how we feel, but God does something different. Second way God changes our life is through He eradicates my guilt. Guilt is a powerful motivator. So a lot of people that have unresolved guilt in their life, and then they act that out. Now, psychologists, are the, they're the, the resident experts on what that looks like. But you don't have to live with that. I mean, you can try to unravel all of that, and you can spend your, a fortune and spend your whole life. Or you can go to God and, and let God just erase all of that says, hey, it's been done. You don't have to do that and live that way, trying to work out all of that emotional regret and pain. You can just give it to God, and God will eradicate it. There's some power that comes with that. I've talked to people that struggle with incredible amounts of guilt, and sometimes they're sobbing. And, and I just, I mean, I, hey, do you, and I'll tell them, do you know about what, you know, the Bible talks about 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. You just go to God with that. Or I love in Romans 8, chapter 1, it says, Therefore there is no condemnation, zero, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So all the condemning voices, all the guilt, all the regret, I wish I had done something different. I wish I hadn't made that decision. If I could only go back and we live and get trapped in the past, and then all of that guilt just starts to rob us of our joy and 
and, and erode our relationships. That doesn't have to be that way. You see, God's word has the power to change all of that. Look at what the Bible says here. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. So if you're a Christ follower, you're part of the church. You're here, and it's, he's not talking about a church building. He's talking about the church, the body of Christ, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word. Now, this morning, most of you probably got up and took a shower, and I'm thankful for that, <laughs> just in case you're wondering, you know, or a bath, I don't know. But you know, when we get up each day and read God's Word, that's a spiritual shower. And when you take a spiritual shower, I'm really thankful for that. And you go, yeah, but nobody, people know. If I don't take a physical shower because I smell. Hey, listen. You might smell more than you realize. With all the stinking thinking and all the things that go on and we have a crappy attitude and you don't know where it came from, you know? I mean, it's easy when you, you know, when you, I didn't take a shower. Oh, I forgot to use soap there. Dang, what was going on? What was I thinking? You know, it's, we make the connection so easy when we smell, when we have B.O., that I didn't take a shower. But when we don't cleanse ourselves, washing of the water through the Word, then all hell breaks loose, all things are coming apart. You didn't take a shower. You didn't take a spiritual shower. Look no further than that says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Let God speak his word into your heart and watch him make you clean. Another thing that happens when we're with God's word and letting him change us is it, it does something uh, in, our, in our spirit person. You know, activates this faith, confidence. You know, I start to, you know, a lot of people, they lack confidence. They're just, they're, they're actually a lot of people are afraid. And Honestly, you can look at the world and the news, and there's a lot of things to be afraid of. The future and what's going to happen, and, you know, with all kinds, right? The list is just too long. But God wants you to live a different life than just paralyzed in fear. He wants you to live a life of confidence. Not afraid to take risks. You step out. You're not afraid of dying. You're not afraid of all of the phobias that are out there. Because you walk in faith. And, and how do we grow in faith? Because as a Christ follower, I certainly would hope that that would be a desire of yours. Hey, I would grow, I'd like to grow in faith. The disciples asked Jesus that. Hey, we want to grow in faith. That's a fair request. How do you do that? Well, when you go and let God's word speak into your heart. It says faith comes from the hearing the message. And what message? The message of the word of Christ. You, have you ever read a Bible verse and if something happens in your spirit, and you go, well, I can do this. You know, all of a sudden you kind of a pep in your step and yeah, that's your faith being activated. That's why when Pastor Sharon spoke a, a couple, what, I guess last week she was saying, hey, I always begin I, before she opens the Bible, she goes, I began, and I pray. I said, God, speak to me. So I was taking notes. I was thinking, you know, I, I need to do that. That's a good idea. I'm still learning. God, speak to me. Activate my faith. I want to grow in this area. I want to learn to what it means to stop worrying all the time and acting like I don't have a felt heavenly father who cares for me. I want God to, to show me that I don't, you know, I can rise above that. You know, there's over 7,000 promises in Scripture that are for you. 7,000, that's a lot. Just, it's an amazing thing. God will grow me, grow my faith, and stimulates stimulates my growth. God wants to stimulate my growth. Now, Paul said to the 
Ephesians. He said, I commit to you, God, and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So Paul's speaking. This is like his last you know, time he's going to see them. And so he goes, listen, you need to hear this. You can be built up through this inheritance. What's he talking about? Well, we have an inheritance. Part of being in the family, especially if you're in a wealthy family, if you were a child of like Warren Buffett, you know, and he had a will, but you didn't know what it was in, what, what was in it. That would, you would be living beneath what was yours to be had. So you want to know what's, what's in the will. And the Bible is, in many ways, like that. It's, it's our inheritance. God, God says, I have an inheritance for you that you can benefit from. You can receive blessings from. But the, the problem is, many times, people don't know they even have an inheritance. There's family privileges. There's, of course, there's family responsibilities. And the good news is God is richer than Buffett. You know, so God has a lot that he wants to impart into your life. And so that's why we go to his word. Look at, I love this. It says all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for, in these four things, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God says, I have a way of, raising you up. And he lists these four things. These four things. He says, teaching is God shows me the path to walk on. Rebuking when I'm in off the right path. He says, that's not a good path for you. And then correcting, he brings you back onto the correct path. And then training, here's how to stay on the path. Because that's not where you want to be. You don't want to be off God's path for you. And so what happens is God's word changes me because it recreates my life, eradicates my guilt, activates my faith, stimulates spiritual growth in my life. Now, this next one, I want um, you to hear about illuminating our minds. And so I've asked Anna Super. She has a, um, she's a fourth year at Regent, uh, getting her undergraduate. God has a call on her life for ministry. She came in as an intern and now has been on staff with us. And so I w would you give her a warm welcome? She's going to share this. Good morning, Vineyard family. How are you guys doing this morning? It is good to see you all. So today I'm going to be talking about point number five, and that is how God uses the Bible to illuminate our minds. And you guys are sitting there and you're asking, well, how does he do that? How does he use the Bible? Well, let's turn to scripture and find out. <laughs> so the scripture says, understanding your word brings light to the minds of ordinary people. I love that. God uses the word to bring light to our minds. And I love this verse says, ordinary people. So often we think it's reserved for certain types of people, certain age groups. It's like at an amusement park, it's like you must be this tall to hear God's word. <laughs> and it's not like that. It's for each of us. It's for me. It's for you. God can use his word to illuminate all of us. You don't have to be a certain age. You don't have to be a pastor or a theologian. It can be for you. And so what we do is God wants to light up every area of our lives. He wants to light up um, the feelings we're feeling. Why are we feeling like that? He wants to bring truth to our relationships, to the successes we're having, to the failures we're having, to the stress from work. He doesn't want to just bring light into our lives. He wants to bring light into every area of our lives. He wants to touch every single area of our lives. But how? You know, so often we pick up the Bible and we're like, I can't hear anything from this. This is the written word. I can't hear this. I don't know what it's saying to me. But God wants to speak to you through it. He wants to replace those self-deprecating words that you're not good enough to hear it, that you don't know enough to hear it, that you're not a good enough Christian to hear it. He wants to replace those self-deprecating thoughts and say, trust God. Trust his love for you. Trust that he has a word for you. And that the word will be revealed to you slowly. We have to practice patience when we're reading the word. <laughs> a lot of the times we open the scripture and we read a verse and we say, God, bring it to me now. <laughs> but it doesn't happen like that. It happens, I, I, I think of it like a sunrise. Like it's not suddenly midnight and then it's 
12 in the morning. Like, it's not noon as soon as you see the sun rising. It takes time. It comes slowly. I remember one time I was, I was singing a song for choir, and it was based on Matthew 11, and that's the verse that says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And that song, you know, it was good. I loved the music, but it didn't really speak to me. It hit me. I liked it, but I couldn't figure out why. And it wasn't until a year later, this past spring, that I was in a time of immense burnout, of immense worry. I was, I was terrified for what I was doing in my life. I was so exhausted. And the Lord brought the verse back to my mind. He, re, he re-illuminated it in my mind because of that song. He brought it back and he said, come to me, Anna. You see, I wouldn't have thought of that if I didn't have that song before, if I hadn't been thinking about that scripture before. And Psalm 119 also says, I have more insight than all of my teachers because your written instructions are in my thoughts. I had to be thinking about that scripture for it to mean something to me. If I wasn't in the scripture, I wouldn't have known what the scripture said. And so you have to have it in your thoughts for it to mean something to you. And at the beginning of this verse, it says, I have more insight than all of my teachers. As Pastor Andy said, I'm a student at Regent right now, and I've been there for three years, and I love my professors. They have taught me so much. But to be honest, I have learned more in my spiritual time with the Lord, my personal time in the Lord in the morning, than I have for three years of Bible classes, (laughs) y'all. And sometimes that's hard to think about. You're like, well, I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to learn so much about the Bible. I'm going to learn so much about the Lord. That's not what happened for me. And I don't think it's what happened for anybody in that school, honestly. (laughs) Sorry to my professors. (laughs) But the Lord will enlighten you more through your personal time with him, through your personal relationship with him. So Psalm 119 is the longest chapter of the Bible, but it also talks about the power of God's word, how it can influence you, how it can reach you. But how do you get that power? I mean, sure, you can read the scripture, but how how do you receive the power that we're talking about? How do you receive it into your heart? And that's through the meditation of the word. You know, Christian meditation, a lot of people will think it's like that cross leg, the mm, it's, it's not that. <laughs> that's not what we do. <laughs> it's not the emptying of your mind that's in um, Hinduism or Buddhism. No, Christian meditation is actually the opposite. And Christian meditation is filling your mind with the word of God. To allow it to sit in you, you have to allow it to sit in your mind. This is, it's like the illustration that Pastor Sharon used a couple weeks ago with the tea bag. You can't just dip it in and throw the tea bag away. <laughs> you gotta let it sit. You gotta let it stay in your heart because the longer you let it sit, the longer you can get a different perspective on what you're going through. And the more you can get a different perspective, the more you'll respond differently to what you're going through. Because the perspective isn't the issue, it's how you respond. It's what you're doing with your life that's important. <laughs> So you have to let the word sit. You have to have it in your thoughts. You have to have it in your heart and let it actually impact you. The Bible says the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now when this was written, lamps were, you know, pretty dark. They were like an oil lamp. They didn't have much light to give. Nowadays we have massive flashlights or a flashlight on our phone and those give a lot more light. But when this was written, a lamp could light maybe two feet in front of you It really wouldn't give you that far. But it was still light. And the word still gave it to your path. You don't need to see all the steps, but the word lights it anyway. You see, when you're walking through something, the light onto your path only lights a few steps ahead of you. But what if I want more light? What if I want to see further in front of me? What if I want to go further? I don't know if you can see this from here. The lights are pretty bright. But I have a flashlight on my phone right now. And if you're asking yourself, well, how, how do I see more than what this is giving me? How do I see more than the two steps this is giving me? There's two ways. The first is you take a step. Because suddenly, it's lighting further in front of you. You don't have what you saw back here because you've moved forward in what the Lord has for you. You've moved forward in it. The only way to take a step forward and to walk is to know what the Lord has for you. <laughs> is to know what his word says, to know what he's telling you and what he wants for you. Everybody has a next step in faith. Sometimes it can be hard to take that first step because you're like, well, I can't see that far. I don't know where I'm going next. You don't need to know where you're going next. You need to know where you're going now. That one step is all you need to know. And that's terrifying, y'all. I remember, I, (laughs) 
A story that speaks to me whenever I talk about taking next steps, because we talk about those a lot here at Vineyard. A story that speaks to me is me coming to this church, because I didn't, I didn't come here just as a congregant on a whim, just to find a home. I'm glad, I'm glad the Lord placed that here, that this is my home now. But this was a step of faith coming here. I came here um, for an internship. You see, I grew up in the church. I grew up in a very small local church, uh, actually here in Virginia Beach. And I had been feeling the Lord pressing on my heart, Anna, take a step out in faith. I have more opportunities for you somewhere else. This place was good for you to grow you, to plant the seeds, to plant the soil, but I have somewhere else for you to go. And that terrified me because I had only ever been at one church. I didn't want to take a step out in faith. I wanted to stay where it was comfortable. And so the Lord brought one of the pastors to my classes and said, here's somebody you can't ignore because <laughs> he's going to talk to you for 15 minutes and you can't ignore him. <laughs> but I, he spoke and I suddenly, I felt the pull again to say, go talk to him. Go see what this church is about. And so I did, and I started coming to this church to the Saturday night service last summer every week while I was serving in the youth group at my other church, while I was leading some middle schoolers at the other church. And as I came here, I felt comfort. I felt peace. I felt a home. It still terrified me to split completely from the church that I had grown up in. But the Lord said, take that step. And so I started the internship here. I became a worship intern. And then I got hired, and now I'm praise the Lord, blessed to be on staff here and blessed to be speaking in front of you. A year ago, I did not think I was allowed to be on this stage. And I am here now, not because I knew that I would be speaking on this stage a year from now. I'm here now because the Lord said, take one step for me. Just one. And I'm going to be honest right now, y'all, because I believe that the spirit speaks through weakness. I'm terrified to be up here. <laughs> I still have those doubts in my mind that this is not where I should be. But the Lord said, take a step. So I'm taking a step because I believe that he will light more of my path, that he will give me confidence, that he will give me where I need to go because he told me that he would. I don't need to see what's 20 miles ahead of me. I need to see this step right here. I need to see this step right here. You guys, it's just one step. That's all you need. And it's terrifying, but you're not alone in needing to take that step. There, every single person in this room is looking for their next step. Pastor Andy's looking for his next step. I'm looking for mine. Every one of you is looking for your next step. And we want to encourage you in that. We want to help you find the way. The second way to get more light onto your path is to add flashlights. Who's the other flashlights? It's everybody else looking for their next steps. Don't do it alone. Don't walk on the path alone. Walk with the other flashlights. How do you do that? You join a small group, y'all. All right. Join a small group, y'all. <laughs> this next week, next Sunday, we're going to be having a small group fair. We're going to have tables in that hallway with people from almost every small group that we're having this semester. You have a chance to talk to the leaders of the groups, find one that fits you, find a light that you can walk with, that they can encourage you in your next steps, they can encourage you in what you're doing in your life. I know I'm going to talk to my leaders of the small group that I'm joining, Dating with a Purpose, but it's... <laughs> somebody else is in it. <laughs> This is going to be before and after both services on Sunday, so make sure you find a group, y'all. Find another light. Find a group of lights that can help you guide your path that you're walking on because you don't need to do it alone. And in fact, it's going to be so much better if you don't. You're going to have so much more light on your path if you do it with 20 other people. And they're going to be able to show you different perspectives of the path that you're on that will light it even more. There might be a right turn coming. That's left, but that's okay. <laughs> there might be a turn coming <laughs> that you don't see, <laughs> but their light might be able to show you what is coming. They will illuminate the scripture. They will illuminate what God is saying in a different way, you guys. So join a small group. Walk in community because God wants to illuminate things together. He wants to enlighten you together. You see, so often we're waiting on God to make the step for us. We'll sit here and we'll say, well, God, I want 20 miles. 
I want you to show me everything that's in my life. We don't need that. And he's not going to show it to you. He really isn't. Because he wants you to trust him. That he knows the path. We need to surrender. You guys, you don't need to see everything. You only need the next few steps. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that we walk by faith, not by sight. God knows us more than we know us. He knows what we need more than we do, and he knows that we don't need to see the next 20 miles because it's going to overwhelm us. It's going to freak us out. It's going to make us freeze in fear and say, God, I'm not moving until you move. And that's not what we need. We need to take that step forward in faith. God wants us to surrender control over what we're doing and to let him guide it, to let him illuminate just the next step because he wants to show you. He wants to use his word to show you what's coming next, but just what's coming next, not what's coming five miles down the road, not what's coming five years down the road, just what's next. He wants that for you. How do we get that? How do we figure out what's next? How do you take a next step if you don't know, if you can't see? You just have to read. Be expectant that when you, when you read the word, God will show it to you, that God will illuminate it to you. Don't enter into the word thinking, I've never heard from God before, so I won't hear from him today. Be expectant that you will, because he has a word for you. He's waiting for you to open your mind to it. He's waiting for you to open your heart to it, to be ready to receive and to surrender your steps to him. You can pray this if you don't know where to go next. You can say, Lord, open my eyes to see the wonderful things in your world. If you don't know where to go next, turn to the word. Pray that it would open your eyes. Pray that you would receive it. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Andy, but I want to read this one more time just so that it sits with y'all. Would you read it with me, you guys? Pray this. Pray, open my eyes to see wonderful things in your word. Well, God uses his word to change lives. What a great, what a great example of that. How can I gain these benefits? Well, talking about uh, all the things God wants to do in our lives, activate our faith, illuminate our minds, stimulate our, our, our spiritual growth, all of these things. Well, it begins with, uh, oops, with, uh, I have to learn it. So I, that's what we've been talking about. I don't want to, you know, uh, flog a dead horse, so to speak, but uh, we need to spend time. And that's one of the reasons why small groups are powerful is because there's, there's accountability. There's people, not in a weird way, not in a judgmental way, in a, an encouragement way. Like just, if something's important to you, you get around people that that's also important to them. And then it, it just, there's something that happens where it, it, it helps us to, to, to grow in that area. Jesus said, the trouble is you don't know the scriptures. That's, you know, the, most of our problems is that most of our now think of the logic here you have two people that have the same problem or pretty much the same problem one collapses one falls apart the other uses that as an opportunity to grow and their character grows and situations change. what's the difference they both had the same problem how they responded to it so god's way of having us respond often is different than our way in fact, it's usually the opposite. Our tendency is somebody offends us, they hurt us. You know, our tendency is, okay, you're getting some back, and it's going to hurt. You know, is that, but that's not always the best way, right? I mean, sometimes we think, oh, if I want, I want people to like me, then I'll try to impress them. You know, then I'll try to, you know, you know make myself look better than I am. But those, that actually doesn't work. It says there's a way that seems right to men, but it actually ends the opposite. We think it's going to give us life. It actually ends up hurting us or hurting others. It says before honor comes humility. So we humble ourselves and let God work through us. And then all of a sudden problems look differently. So we learn it. 
Number two, we have to accept it. This one's challenging. It's one thing to learn the Bible. It's another thing to make it the authority in your life. You know, because honestly, the, some of the Bible is, you know, it's challenging. I mean, how else do I say it, right? I don't like that. That's inconvenient. That's not popular. I don't understand why God would say something like that, so I will ignore it. I mean, on and on and on. So at some point, we just have to, you know what? This isn't politically correct. It's not popular. It might even be difficult to do, but I accept it. When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, he commends them. Not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you as you believe. So that's part as well. So I first learn it, then I accept it. Thirdly, I need to act on it. I act on it. Because the Bible says that we're blessed, we're blessed. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you take notes if you write those down no if you memorize them you're only blessed for the parts of the bible you do not the parts of the bible you know so we want to walk in god's blessing and that's always important to me because i i there's people that pray more than me but i consider myself a, a man of prayer but i i know that i but I also am super efficient. If you know anything about me, I hate wasting time. And, I, and I'm real acutely aware when I'm praying, am I wasting my time? Because if I'm not praying what God wants me to pray, if I'm not praying according to Scripture, I'm wasting my time. I'm just speaking it out. Miles, I could be doing anything, probably more productive. Just because you're in prayer does not mean it having any effect at all. We need to pray according to God's word, according to God's ways, his will. Then we're blessed. Then we step out and we start to do it. That's my goal. That's my goal for the church, for myself, and certainly for you, because I want you to walk in God's blessing. Okay, would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the guidance you give us, the wisdom that just cascades down from heaven to us as we read your word. Some of you, you, you need to just, you know, Anna talked about surrender. You need to say, I accept the word of God as the authority in my life. If you've never done that, that'll be the most righteous prayer you'll probably ever pray up to this point. It'll be the most effective prayer. God, make your word the authority of my life. Even though I struggle with agreeing with it, sometimes it doesn't make sense, and sometimes, honestly, I don't like it. It certainly is not convenient. It's not popular. But it is the truth. And it changes me if I allow it. Would you pray that? Say, God, help me to not only learn it. I want to learn it. Help me to learn it. I want to accept it, and then help me to do it you pray this prayer say God I give you permission to recreate something new in my life set me free God you just pray that. set me free from from guilt and my past regrets that just so often hamper me from the growth that you want to do in my life would you say God activate my faith activate my faith. Be a lamp unto my feet. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, then I'm going to invite you to do that right now. Right now, you do that through prayer. The Spirit of Christ is inviting you to take your next step. If you've never said yes to Christ, or maybe you found yourself way away, God's been working on you. He's inviting you home then I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now, right where you're at, with every head bowed, every eye closed. Some of you, this is the most important moment of this entire day, maybe the whole, maybe of your whole life. 
God's speaking to you. He's inviting you to come home. He's inviting. He wants to be your Warren Buffett. He wants to give you the inheritance. That belongs to you. But you've got to be part of the family of God. You're not born into the family of God just because you're a human. You're born again into the family of God when you put your faith in Christ. And if you've never done that or you find yourself far from God right now, then I want you to pray with me. I want to lead you in a prayer right where you're at. If that's you, let me know about it, would you? Just put your hand up. You can slip it up just so that I can see it. Say, I want to pray with you. That's, that's a prayer I want to pray. Bless you. Yep. Okay. Bless you. Yep. Anyone else? Say, this is my moment. Okay. You can put your hands down. Pray this prayer with me right now. Say, dear God, today, I accept your word. Do a great work in my life. I want to come home. I want to live a life that's blessable. I put my faith in you. You can see me through this. All the challenges that come my way or that maybe I'm in, maybe you're in them right now. Say, God, in the challenge I'm in, in my moment, change my thinking. Align myself with the way you see me. You say, God, give me a fresh start. Thank you for forgiving me. Take my next step 